Hey guys, I'm um, gonna go over your review for your test here uh, with you guys today. Um, obviously, if you guys aren't sure about any of this stuff and you got it wrong and you have questions about it, make sure that you ask um, so that you guys are ready for to go for your test. And um, you know, if there's something you're still struggling with, I can send you extra practice. I can uh, we can zoom or whatever and. Uh, just let me know. You gotta let me know, otherwise it can't really help you. All right, so let's, uh, you know, these videos are usually kind of long. So let's jump right into it, shall we? Uh, let's see here, the first one, uh, five, the fourth root of five. All right, we wanna rewrite it in a, um, with a fractional exponent. So we know that the, the exponent on the inside would be one. That's always the numerator. The denominator is the one from the outside, right? So the fourth root of five is the same thing as five to the one fourth. Uh, if there was another number besides one in here, right? That would just go on top there and we would just rock it out the same way there. Cool. Uh, second one, one of these fun ones that I know you guys love. 3 to the x over 2 times 3 to the x over 4 equals 3 to the 6th. Well, what's nice about this one is all of those bases are already the same. Uh, so over here, when we are multiplying, we know that we add the exponents. So we can just multiply this one by 2 over 2. That would be 2x over 4 plus 1x over 4. And that's going to be 3x over 4. When I add those, because they have the same base, uh, we add the exponents. And then we can just drop the bases all together and set that equal to 6. And then just multiply by 4 thirds that's the reciprocal uh, one, two, that would be eight so you should have got eight for X on number two all right number three uh, same situation only this time there are fractions we know if something's a fraction we could rewrite it as a negative exponent which is exactly what I'm going to do So if I want to take this one out of a fraction, it would be 3 to the negative first. Just flip it over. This one, if I want to write, I want it to have the same base also. So I know that this is just 3 squared. And then if I take it into a fraction, and, or out of a fraction, it would be 3 to the negative second. And now I can distribute, do power to a power here. That would be negative 1x minus 1. Um, forgot my equal sign there. And over here, negative 2x minus 6. And then I can drop the base and just set the uh, exponents equal to each other. And let's see, add 2x to both sides. That'll give me x plus negative 1 equals negative 6. And then just add 1. And x equals negative Five. So you should have got, oh, can't really see the bottom, can you? Here. Bam. X equals negative five there. Very cool. All right. Uh, number four, this one's kind of cool. So I know if I want to find the area of that rectangle, uh, or the area of a rectangle, which is five feet, is length times width. So I kind of need to know the length and the width here. So I'll draw kind of a not good picture. These two are squares. Uh, and we don't know anything about square C. Okay, so first of all, I can do something up here. 
if it, this is a square, I know that it's length times width, but I know that those are the same, right? So it's like side times side. So something times something gave me six. Well, to figure out what that something is, I can square root it, uh, and I can just do it the easy way and leave this square root of six, square root of six, right? Because that's the only thing I could multiply together to give me six. Square root of six times square root of six is just six. So I know this side, and I don't know this side. So what I did was I set up a little equation here. I know that the area of a rectangle is length times width. So length times width, we'll just call that x, equals 5. And then all you got to really do is divide by square root of 6. And then there is some weird rules here that you guys don't even know about. So um, I'm thinking most of you probably gave me a decimal, which 5 divided by square root of 6, oops, 5 divided by square root, oh boy. There we go. Should have given you something about 2.04124. All right, if you thought, hey, you should leave it as a fraction, because you know, you usually should leave it as a fraction, right? Um, there's this rule in math that you can't leave a square root on the bottom of a fraction. Um, so honestly, I think I would be okay with it, um, because you guys didn't know that, obviously. But um, just to kind of show you if mathematically speaking, if this ever happens to you, um, to get rid of it, you just multiply by square root of 6 over square root of 6. Whatever the square root is, you just multiply by that number again. And that would give you 5 square root of 6. Square root of 6 times square root of 6 gives you just 6. And that's actually the same thing. Um, it's it's uh, rationalizing the denominator, if you want to uh, put some words to that. But for you guys, if you guys got here, I'm pretty happy with that. Or even if you got 5 to over square root of 6, that's really good. Because at least you show that you know what we're talking about with the square and the rectangle. I thought that one was kind of cool. Little, I always like ones that you can apply what we know about. So, All right, so let's see here. Number 5. So they already give you a power to a power up here, which is kind of weird. <clears throat> so 1 half times x is just 1 half x. And then um, when I divide numbers with the same base, I subtract their exponents. So that would give me 3 to the 1 half x minus 1 half. And then I can drop the base. So 1 half x minus 1 half equals 1. And then just solve this little two-stepper here. 1 plus 1 half is 3 halves. And then times by 2 to get rid of 1 half, and that would be 3. There you go. All right, number 6 here. Let's talk about some exponential functions. That was enough exponent rule stuff, I'm sure you guys will agree. So um, in our basic exponential function, or in this case, uh, we change it, the parent function to a 5, which is fine. doesn't really change anything, right? So f of x equals 5 to the x. The domain is going to be all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. Um, remember, if you want to write it that way, you just use parentheses because you can't actually include infinity ever. So there's our domain. Our range, however, is different. Um, it is going to be two ways you can write that, right? You could say that it is where y is greater than, or nope, not equal to, <laughs> just greater than 0, because it doesn't include 0 because of that horizontal asymptote, right? Uh, or you could write from 0 to infinity. 
the zero needs to have a soft bracket, uh, the parenthesis, because it doesn't include the zero. Um, let's see, the horizontal asymptote, um, that would be the line y equals zero. Right? If it's a horizontal asymptote, it's going to be y equals, because we know that that's a, the, a horizontal line. And in this case, it's going to be at zero. And the y-intercept is one, because if you plug in zero for x, you're going to get one back out. So our graph here of the next one, very similar. Now, obviously, your graph is like super zoomed in and stuff, or I'm sorry, zoomed out and stuff, but you can still get a pretty good picture of what it looks like, right? Um, if you made a table of values, that would be fine. All right, so maybe you did a quick table, negative 1, 0, 1, 2. Negative 1 would give you 1 third, 0 would give you 1, 1 would give you 3, 3 squared is 9. All right, but we know it's going to be growth. We know it's going to have a y intercept at 1. Those are our key features, right? So as long as, we'll put this point on because it'll fit on there. It should look something like that for your graph. And if you have the table there, that's really easy for me to grade it because I'll be like, yeah, they know where, what's going on, right? Yeah, sure. Uh, number eight, we had to flip it. So this time they gave me the table and they wanted me to write what the equation was. So first off, the starting point uh, would be 27. That's my y-intercept. So I know that number goes first. And then whatever my common ratio is. Uh, so this time, what did I multiply by each time to get the next number? In this case, it was one-third. So one-third goes in here to the x power. And that is my lovely equation. Uh, number nine, it is definitely an exponential function because if it doubles, that means um, that it is a percent change. So it's definitely, uh, it has constant ratio of two. Uh, I wrote the equation f of x equals six times two to the x. Uh, number 10, let's set that one up for you. The population is 12,000. We know that means that's going to be our starting point. It grows at a rate of 5% a year. So it grows, so we have a plus in here. 5% is going to be 0 0.05 as a decimal. And then it says how many people live there in four years. That's our four up here. That's what it would look like. And when I plugged it in, I got C, uh, 14,586. Uh, with, with some loose change. Some half people walking around there. All right, 11, same idea. We want to invest $2,000, so that's our starting point. Uh, at an interest rate of 4%, compounded quarterly. So we have compound interest here. So we put the 4% on top, compounded quarterly, so we need to divide it by 4. And then to the 4t, how many years do they want in this one? Three years, so it's going to be 3 times 4. So there's my setup. Uh, and then I got option B when I plugged it in my calculator, uh, which is $2,253.65. Number 12, we have one that's going down. So now the population is decreasing. That's my exponential decay. So it starts with 20,000 and it decreases at 9%. So remember inside here, now we need that minus sign. Make sure on your test that you read very carefully if it says growth or decay or, or increase or decrease or whatever that says, because that's going to tell you which part of which uh, function you need to use, right? Which equation, minus or plus in there. Uh, and then it says, what would X have to be, or T have to be, um, in order for the population to be fewer than 13,000? Um, so I, again, you can just plug in numbers. You can look at the table in your calculator. It should have been five years. Uh, five years, which was option C. 
And then 13 is my last one of those. Um, oh, I don't have to say anything, do I? I did set it up for me. Um, it was 1,200 times 1 minus 0.1 to the x power. Um, but if we think about exponential decay, at first it's going to decrease quickly, and then at the end it decreases much slower. So in this case, they just wanted to know that at the beginning it's going to decrease more quickly, right? That fall at first is a lot, and then it's much less. All right, into some sequences here. So 14, they wanted to know if it was a geometric sequence. It sure is. Um, in this case, uh, you're multiplying by one half each time. So each time it's one half of the last one. So it has a common ratio uh, of one half. So it is a geometric sequence. Number 15, they wanted me to write the explicit and recursive formula. Now for you guys, also be prepared, they didn't ask this, but also be prepared to um, find a value. You know, if I said, what about the 10th term? You know, be able to, to plug that in to figure that out, okay? So in this case, each time you're multiplying by three halves, or one and a half, right? So that's my common ratio. Um, let's see here. So let's do recursive. I don't know why they give you explicit first. I like starting with recursive. So that's what I did first. So for recursive, a sub 1 would be 10. That's my first number. And then each time, we're multiplying by 3 halves, so it's going to be 3 over 2. Uh, times a sub n minus 1. So that's what my first one looks like there, the recursive one. Um, and then the explicit one, my first number is 10. Multiply that by our ratio, 3 halves, to the n minus 1. And that's the explicit form. Very nice, very nice. There we go. All right. Um, super. Number 16, they gave me the explicit form, which was this. And then we had to write it in uh, recursive. So I know this is my initial value. This is my ratio, my constant common ratio. So when I'm breaking it down, I know I want uh, a sub 1, which is in this case 125. And then a sub n equals our ratio times a sub n minus 1. So that's what the recursive formula would look like from that explicit one. And then 17, we're doing the same thing. We're just flipping it, right? So this time they gave me the recursive formula of and a sub 1 is 1 eighth. So when we're setting ours up, we know that a sub 1 goes first. That's our initial value times our rate, which in this case must be the 2, and it's to the n minus 1 power. So there is the explicit based on the um, recursive there. All right, only three left. 18, um, that minus 3 at the end, that is going to shift it down three units. Right, we know a minus or a plus at the end is going to just shift up or down. That's a vertical shift. In this case, it's minus 3, so it's going to go down. And number 19, it, the change was in the exponent, 
right? So it said x minus 4. So if it's written in the exponent, that's a horizontal shift. So in this case, it's minus 4. You got to remember that is opposite, right? So it's going to go to the right 4. And then my last one here, um, they wanted me to compare these two functions. So f of x is 2 to the x, our parent function. And then from the table, I just kind of wrote what g of x was. I felt like that was helpful for me. So its initial value is 1 half. And this one is doubling each time multiplied by 2. So that's going to be 2 to the x in here. So those are the two functions, and they want to know what were the same, what were different. Well, they do have the same domain. They're both negative infinity to positive infinity. They do have the same range because we didn't move the asymptote, right? All we did was we threw a one-half in front of here, so it's going to go up less steep um, than it did before. That's fine. Or uh, this is my y-intercept now, right? Um, they do not have the same y-intercepts because that's this number in front. So this initial value is 1 half. This one would be 1. I plug in 0, 2 to the 0 is 1. I plug in 0, 2 to the 0 is 1. 1 times 1 half is 1 half. Um, and they also have the same asymptote. It's not going to change. So A, B, and D are all true, but they do not have the same y-intercept. That almost got me. Not going to lie to you. All right, cool. Um, the only other thing I can think of that I didn't put on this review is at the beginning we reviewed our exponent rules, just did some practice exponent rules. I threw two of those on your test. Um, so just review those, look at your notes, look over some stuff. If you uh, want to be prepared for those two on your test, um, that's really it. Otherwise, let me know if you have any questions and I'll catch you guys later.